I can't do it. I lo- whoop. Oh, it's so good. <laughs> One of our more smooth starts here. Hello, everyone. <laughs> it's just, I had the best timing when I hit record, right? When you're but, saying see, something. I know, but Philip, all you have to do is remember when you hit yeah. record, a message pops up on my screen that I have to click off. So yeah. all you have to do is wait like three seconds mm-hmm. <laughs> and then I will be, but you always go, I've clicked record. I'm ready to go. Doesn't matter about anyone else. That is why you are the nemesis. Plus it's more fun that way. <laughs> I guess I get the best rise out of you. <laughs> I would never do it on purpose though. <laughs> Hello, everyone. Welcome to another discussion uh, of how to <laughs> how to annoy your nemesis, or I mean, how to analyze stories. And today we are talking about, appropriately enough, tone and style. And we're going to also bring in stuff like irony and genre and audience, and all this is going to connect in some brilliant way, which even we cannot foresee. <laughs> overselling it a touch there philip well so that's tone that's a perfect illustration of tone now what is the intended uh message well pay attention to tone but let's start with style i think style is a little bit easier to define because the two of them often do get confused which is one reason why we want to talk about them style i I love to give the analogy of music in the case of, of trying to define style now when i hear i listen to a lot of classical music i have all my life loved classical music when I hear a composition on a radio I've never heard before, I often will be able to identify the composer, even if I haven't heard that piece, because there are certain stylistic things that I recognize, uh, that uh, there are certain uh, flourishes that that particular composer favored or that were prominent during that particular, let's say, Baroque period or what, what have you. And so I can narrow it down that way first. Oh, this is Baroque. And then I can say, oh, that thing there, that sounds like Vivaldi. That's a Vivaldi piece, right? Because there are certain things, identifiers that are part of Vivaldi's, let's call it style. There may be a musical term for this that I'm unaware of. But anyway, I love the analogy because I think authors are very similar. And the ways that we can identify uh, an author's style would include figures of speech, imagery, uh, also diction. In other words, word choice. Uh, there are different levels of formality, uh, or you might have an author who f- prefers a, a more uh, a, a pared down style, like Hemingway, minimalism, that sort of thing, versus Faulkner. That's the classic you know, pairing of opposites there. Faulkner has a more flowery style. So when we're talking I, about- I, I, yeah. Hang on a sec. Stop calling Faulkner flowery. Uh-oh. Flowery is almost always used as a pejorative. Yeah. If, yeah. if I like Faulkner's style, but yeah. Yeah. Rich. Mm -hmm. Rich. Good. Yeah, you're right. It is used pejoratively, unfortunately, um, because I like that sort of thing myself. But uh, and just illustrating the differences here. And uh, these are important. And in fact, so when we talk about diction, okay, let's just focus on that for a moment as one aspect of style. Diction meaning word choice. So if I say to you, AP, I'm walking to the store right now. We're on the phone. We're talking to each other. And I say to you, I'm walking to the store right now. What if I said, I am perambulating to the store right now? I have made a, it means the same thing, right? But I have changed my word choice. And the word perambulate has a different connotation to it, doesn't it? As opposed to walking. Yes. And some of this, some of this about <clears throat> word choice is a, in the modern day, quite often readers say it should be simple and basic. And uh, simple does not mean basic. Basic does not mean simple. Right. They are actually two different things. Right. But uh, if you had uh, a Jane Austen character saying, well, I'm, um, we should engage in a perambulation uh, of the grounds. Yes. And you would associate that with a certain social status or level of education or a differentiation about that's telling you something about the character or the type of person or, or this sort of thing. Yeah. But if in the same book you had someone say, want to walk around the garden, 
that's much more down to earth. And so if you had a high lady, an aristocrat, in which you were trying to portray a certain level of not only education, but potentially snobbishness or pretentiousness of using elevated language, mm. that the word choice itself, even though perambulation, it's where we get the word pram from for, yeah. you know, uh, putting a baby in to take a baby for a walk. It's a pram, perambulation. Right. Um, we use derivatives of that word. It's a perfectly normal word, but it is no longer used as a standard description because walk is more basic, more commonly used. They mean roughly the same thing. Mm -hmm. um, but if you had that distinction, want to walk around the grounds, we should perambulate, or want to walk around the garden, we should perambulate uh, across the estate. Um, that can be used to reflect different things with the characters, uh, a gardener or a commoner or a normal person versus an elevated person, which then links to the position of the narrator. Because if the narrator feels that something is normal, that is going to tie into the uh, accepted norm of the reality. Yeah. And if something is viewed as elevated, that is higher than the norm. If perambulation is where the norm is, then you will have that is norm. That's how people speak. And a low born person or a lower level. So you see, we've moved the register to what the base level is, is now up in this level of diction. And we are indicating that that's the base norm. And anyone below that, that's where we measure it from. Normal is up here. Low level down here, as opposed to normal here, high level up. Good. So, oh, oh. no, yeah. So, just in terms of the style, to reiterate, when we're identifying an author's style, we're really identifying it by the figures of speech that they favor, the imagery they favor, and the type of diction that they favor. That can vary in an author, too. One of our favorite authors, Stephen Erickson, has quite a range, really, of, of different styles that he can write in, even within the same series. Uh, but it does tend to be the case that uh, authors, you, you, you get to know their tics, as it were, right? Like Erickson has been accused of using the word ochre every once in a while, although that is exaggerated. <laughs> but nevertheless, that's kind of the one, one of the fun kind of, um, I guess, stereotypes about his writing. Oh, ochre. Oh, boy. You know, or, uh, you know, I've been accused of using the word Bernie, I think, is one of the ones that I got uh, a flack for. Um, but there, it goes beyond just that. It's it's a, a certain um, even beyond that you you can see authors have their like composers have their favorite little flourishes and things that they like to do. Authors tend to like to explore similar themes all the time. They they tend to have their their ticks. They tend to have their favorite uh, images that they like to play with, uh, or um, even word choice. Sometimes I think Jenny Wirtz is a brilliant example of an author that I feel like, just like I hear Vivaldi on the radio, I know that's Vivaldi. When I read a passage written by Jenny Wirtz, I feel like I'm going to know that's Jenny Wirtz right there. Uh, and and I love that. Uh, and and she is a great example of an author with, with a, a wonderful range of diction uh, and, and an author who is unafraid to use it as well. Uh, would you agree with that? Yeah, and it's interesting because in some respects, style quite often illustrates aspects of author voice. Voice is a very nebulous concept. Right. Uh, the, the authorial voice, an, an author's voice, where they, they talk about finding their voice, how they want to tell stories. Right. Style, if they have a style that they commonly use, quite often it's an articulation of aspects of that voice, mm. that there's a strong link between the two. But then authors can write in completely different styles. Style ties in very heavily to how the story is being expressed, how the narrative right. is being communicated, how the world is being evoked. It's the how, not necessarily the what. <laughs> right, right, precisely. So as you say, uh, a writer like Joe Abercrombie might be using a slightly different style when he's with the Northmen. Uh, as as opposed to when he's with uh, Jezal or someone like that. Um, so, yeah, and that really does kind of lead to, unless you want to say more about style, that does lead to the idea of tone, 
which was where people can get confused. So do you, shall I start to define t- uh, tone or do you want to say more about style first? Well, no, um, why don't we move through this? Because we're going to be going backwards and forwards once we've kind of stopped. So why don't, why don't we start off with you uh, giving us tone? Okay. So tone, uh, to distinguish it from what we've been talking about, is the attitude of the implied author. Now, we talked about what the implied author is in one of our early videos, um, but essentially the implied author, as it, you explained it very well earlier, AP, let's just quickly remind people what uh, implied author means, and then I'll finish defining tone. Okay, so we have a physical historical person who created the book. They are the author, right. but that physical person ages over time. Well, their views may change. And so five years, 10 years, 20 years after they have written the book, they are technically no longer that person. They don't think the same way. They may not have the same views on things. They will have changed. So the implied author is the construct of that sort of image of the author at the time of writing. Right, perfect. And we can sometimes (laughs) derive uh, a conception of it from the text, right? but more accurately, we're usually looking at narrator. Good. So that being the case, the tone then is the attitude of the implied author and or narrator, okay, uh, toward the characters and the events in the story. So the, um, the, the attitude of the implied author or the narrator toward the characters and events in the story. And this is often... Um, you could, you could, another way of phrasing that is how does the implied author want you to feel about the characters and events in the story? And sometimes we can, we can uh, deduce this from certain clues, uh, certain strategies that the implied author or narrator may be using, such as overstatement or hyperbole, uh, which a great example of that might be Kurt Vonnegut's Harrison Bergeron, a short story where he just kind of goes for all kinds of crazy hyperbolic stuff. Uh, it's, it's a story that's set in the future of the United States of America, where everything has gone all wacky. Uh, and he has, <laughs> hey, he just kind of has fun. Uh, but there's a point behind all that hyperbole. And there's a difference in the, okay, so there, there's a discrepancy, let's call it, between the literal meaning and the a meaning that we, the reader, are understanding when, when, the, when the implied author or the narrator is using hyperbole or when they're using understatement, or it's also called litities sometimes. Uh, so you have overstatement or hyperbole, and then you have understatement or litities. And these are ways where the author or implied author or narrator kind of clues you in that the, the, there's the literal meaning, which maybe the characters in the story are experiencing, but you, the reader, are being clued in that there's another whole layer of meaning. And that discrepancy is often very important for understanding the story, is it not? Yes, and quite often, this is one of the things that will then signal a particular type of genre like satire or will uh, right. be doubling down and reinforcing irony, stuff that we're going to get into. Yep. But for instance, the opening of uh, Jane Austen's Pride and Prejudice. Beautiful example. It is a truth universally acknowledged that a single man in possession of a fortune uh, must be in want of a wife. <laughs> now, if, if we did a literal, well, uh, everyone agrees that if you're a single man and have a lot of money, then you must want and be desirous of a wife. You know, that would be the literal meaning. But because of how it is framed, because of how it is told to us, we guess that this is a prejudicial statement, that this is a biased statement. And there is a deep sense of irony attached to the statement that this is going to be reflective of a position within the text. And um, that it's that playfulness of language. Um, We sometimes, I think sometimes can, uh, sarcasm is a way that we could talk about it, it you know, in real yeah. life. Yeah, verbal irony, uh, yeah. Verbal irony, but you know, like, oh, you are so clever. And you know, the literal words, you are so clever, but clearly I'm going, you're, you're a dumbass. Um, 
what is being said, but the meaning being conveyed, it is clear that not only is the meaning different, but I intended that meaning. Right. Wait, were you so directing it, that at me? Was, was that? Oh, of of course not, Philip. Uh, wait, was that more verbal irony there? No. <laughs> <laughs> and but th this is one of the reasons why this in particular can be a, a little difficult because because it overlaps and ties so it's about the creation of these effects and of okay. signaling and transmitting information and communicating information to the reader that that information is always tied to something being communicated and quite often it's these other things so you can see how there there can be quite an overlap between these but yeah. what we're talking about here is this communication and how it is being reflected. And if we misread that, if we don't pick up on the clues that are inherent in it, right. that can lead to like an absolute misreading of the text. Exactly. Um, and I think we'll, we'll probably discuss Swift's A Modest Proposal at some point in, in relation to this. Oh, we must. Yeah, that is a great example um, of of all of the, the things we've been talking about, really, but uh, irony uh, and different types of irony. Um, but before we go on to irony, let's just reiterate, uh, talk, once again, when we're talking about tone, we're talking about the attitude of the implied author or the narrator toward the characters and the events in the story, which may or may not, sometimes it can be the same, by the way, it doesn't have to be, uh, you don't, there isn't necessarily a discrepancy there, but when there is a discrepancy, that's often very telling, um, so. Um, and one of the difficulties is if you think, like we use the word tone, which is clearly an auditory clip. Yes. Like that's why we talk about tone. It's actually kind of like tone of voice in a way, isn't it, right? Um, and it's almost being used by analogy to, you know, how we would understand voice and the sound of something but right. if you think of um in star wars a new hope when darth vader uh sort of the stormtroopers have come in and darth vader enters the rebel ship yeah we don't look at him and go oh i wonder if he is a good guy or a bad guy that <laughs> meaning has been communicated to us through the uh, right. the diegetic sounds the extra diegetic sounds the shot of him where the camera is looking slightly up so he is more even more imposing and like prize was a very tall actor to begin with sure. but quite a lot of the time darth vader is shot with this upward angle to make him loom and seem more menacing very all nemesis these... like yeah well everyone is tall and menacing to you because like you're only what two feet tall <laughs> very funny <laughs> But we can we can gain all, before he says anything, before he does anything, we're going, bad guy. It's like, yeah. How did we know that? No discrepancy there. Yeah. Um, so it, it's really interesting. And we talked earlier about atmosphere. And one of the previous is we were talking about atmosphere. The mm -hmm. evocation of atmosphere is often done through tone. Right. That in the word choice and describing even a in a room if the shadows are you know, dark and imposing, that is making us think about those things in a very specific way. It's communicating the meaning behind a shadow because shadows are normal. But why is that shadow sinister? That tone quite often is used as a way to create atmosphere or to signal genre or to signal irony. or And you see how suddenly tone can become this linkage between a lot of things, which is why it can be kind of messy sometimes. Probably. Yeah, but let's get some examples that might be helpful. Okay. Um, so Edgar Allan Poe is a great example because it's pretty easy to identify the tone of an Edgar Allan Poe story. How does the implied author or narrator want you to feel about the characters and the events of the story? In the case of pretty much any Edgar Allan Poe story, there is a sense of this person and place being haunted, right? And that's where you're talking about, you were earlier just mentioning atmosphere, right? And so tone is a great way to achieve atmosphere. So if we were gonna go for trying to define the tone of an Edgar Allan Poe story, we could begin with the word haunted. We could begin with, we could also describe the madness, the insanity in involved here. 
This is how the, not how the character sees themselves necessarily, right? This is how the implied author or narrator wants us to see this character as somebody who is in the throes of madness, who is haunted, who is in a state of, of, of loss and despair. Um, and that's, I think, a fairly clear example, right, of, of, of tone there. And style, once again, is how uh, through the figures of speech, through the imagery. So if you have the telltale heart, you have this, this repeated auditory thing, also image of this beating heart. Bum, 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 bum. And that, that, that's uh, part of the imagery. That's a stylistic thing. Um, and also word choice. Edgar Allan Poe uses a whole bunch of words that conjure this, this uh, style, uh, which feeds into the tone that, again, which is how the narrator slash uh, implied author wants us to feel about the story, which is kind of uh, eerie and haunted and, and frightened and all of that. Is that, that. That's a pretty good example. You got some other ones? Um, well, I was, I was actually thinking of like Oscar Wilde's plays. Ah, brilliant. Yes. And in that you can, uh, and again, because it is tying into satire and critique, but mm -hmm. you can see how these characters believe very much in themselves. But right. the framing of the narration, how the story is being narrated to us, even right. though it's a play, it you know, but we clearly are critical of these characters. It's like, how do you know that? And it was Wilde's ability to present the characters in a certain way that right. we would know when we were watching that we were meant we weren't meant to think, oh that is an upstanding, wonderful person and I should agree with them. We're meant to see them as factless or we're meant to see them as hypocritical. So in the, the importance of being earnest, for example, you, you have characters who who uh, may be keeping up appearances in some ways, right? And we're meant to understand that, yeah. Um, but there, in fact, you, you mentioned keeping up appearances. There was a TV show in the UK called Keeping Up Appearances. Oh, Mrs. Bucket. Oh, no, Bouquet. Excuse no, me. Bouquet. <laughs> and her surname is spelled Bucket. Bucket. But because she has delusions of a higher social status, she insists yeah. on being called Bouquet. Right, right. <laughs> and, and she does not see that ironically, but we, the audience, are laughing at her pretentiousness, right? Uh, and that's because we're meant to see that, right? And, you know, obviously some of the characters in the TV show will yeah. react the same way that the audience does. Right. But she's she is unaware of this. Right. Um, right. She's just frustrated with these idiots who can't pronounce her name. Right. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so it, it's wonderful when when these things and again, they work together. It, yeah. And it can be sometimes a little bit difficult to to tease them apart, to look at them very, very specifically. Right. But ultimately, what we're trying to do is gain a greater understanding of the text in front of us. And of course, that's what we do when we read. Analysis, literary analysis, is just a slight extension of what we do when we read. It's just being slightly more aware and right. conscious of how that meaning is created. Analysis is not some separate thing. It actually happens when we read, and the more... Uh, conscious effort we put into it, the, the closer it comes to a specific. Yeah. I do want to mention uh, how uh, I mentioned this briefly earlier, but just to expand on this one point that an author is capable of various styles and often the style will be in support of the tone. So for example, Stephen Erickson, this is an author without any specific spoilers or any moments. Uh, this is an author with, I said, incredible range. And you can see within the Malazan Book of the Fall in many moments of high tragedy. And when you see those moments of high tragedy, you tend to have a, a style that is uh, reminds many people of, say, Shakespeare or that kind of thing. Whereas you also have some very comedic moments. And Erickson will shift his style in those moments. He will choose different diction. He will choose different... Uh, word choice in those moments in order to convey this is a this is a comedic moment and he's going for a different style uh, and purposefully uh, and, and that's a I think a, 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 the author who springs to mind but there are many obviously that you can find but, who do this sort of thing and you actually you made reference to one of the classic ones that has this built into the place Shakespeare yes we know. think of the iambic pentameter of the right. noble or elevated characters right and then the rude mechanicals, the uh, the more common or lowborn characters, right, who don't 
speak in iambic pentameter. They right. don't speak with that meter and rhythm. Good. And we can have uh, these highborn. Uh, think of a Midsummer Night's Dream. Theseus and Hippol Hippolyta. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, but you can have the nobles uh, yeah. in a scene that we are meant to be laughing at. So it is a humorous scene. But uh -huh. we can also have uh, the rude mechanics in a humorous scene. So Nick we Bottom know that they're both the humorous. Yeah. Yeah. But how it is achieved and uh, the level of diction and all that all changes. So both scenes are humorous, but quite often they're humorous in different ways. Right. And but that's a like a really stark existence or a stark example of a completely different style and quite often a completely different tone, but yet still achieving the same end within yeah. the same narrative. Yeah, brilliant. So style is often how you can sort of identify your your author and um, tone is how they want you to feel about these characters and events in the story, right? Uh, so let's talk about irony. Uh, we, we brought that up and we mentioned, we, we sort of danced around verbal irony already, which you could just simply call sarcasm if you want. Um, if, do you want to make yeah, a distinction there? Okay, yeah. Well, Sar sarcasm is a very specific form of verbal type irony. of verbal, verbal irony. It's a wee bit bigger yeah so when there's a difference between um the literal meaning of what is being said and uh an implied meaning um for the speaker you have an example of verbal irony right yeah because you know uh we can't record videos together anymore philip you know it, yeah. it's not me it's you no <laughs> one says that they would go it's not you it's me. What they mean is, no, 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 no. It, it is definitely you. <laughs> what is being said? No, there was no. no sarcasm involved in that. Right. But what is being said and what is being communicated? There is verbal irony. When I say it's you, not me, that would be literal and that would be the truth and there'd be no uh, confusion. But right. if I say, oh, it's me, not you, it's to spare your feelings, but anyone who heard that would go, no, 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 no. It is definitely that other guy, not because there's a, a difference in in how we interpret that. That's a, like a really common one that people pick up from, you know, romantic comedies. Yep, absolutely. Uh, and another type of irony then would be situational irony, where there's um, a, a difference between um, where the character has a position a certain expectation that is reversed, that is uh, unfulfilled, or, or events come out in an unexpected way. Um, and that is situational irony, um, where, and it, it's also a type of, if I have this right, situational irony is a type of dramatic irony. Um, there's the distinction there being where there's a gap between what the character believes and expects to happen and what the reader or audience knows is going to happen. Yeah. So, so audience dramatic, I dramatic irony in general is when we as reader uh, know something is going to happen. So, right. like, let's say in um, a war film, you know, uh, we see the bad guys launch a missile, and like we know the missile is coming. Now, obviously, the good guys don't know that they're they're sitting there and go, "Oh, we've sorted everything out. As long as no bombs fall from the sky today, we're going to be absolutely fine." Now, we as viewer know that they're in for a bad day because this thing is already in the air. So there's your dramatic irony. Now, situational life is obviously a form of that. Right. Um, but isn't reliant on reader knowledge. Right. And exactly. It, but it, it, essentially, it, it's much the same thing where a not an Alanis Morissette song, the old <laughs> joke about that. The only thing ironic about that song is that none of the examples are actually out. Um, <laughs> my one of my favorite examples of dramatic irony is uh, uh, Tess of the Durvilles and by Thomas Hardy. There's a moment where she slips a note confessing her love uh, for Angel and under the uh, the his door, but unbeknownst to her, it goes under the mat and he never gets the note. And if he had gotten the note, he would have known better and everything would have turned out different. Um, and the reader knows that note is there under the mat and they're just screaming with frustration. 
Uh, but uh, Angel doesn't know and Tess doesn't know that he didn't get the note, right? That sort of thing. Yeah, and this is one of the things quite often, uh, you can visualize this very, very clearly uh, because it's been used a lot in film and TV where let's say you have um, two characters like, right, you, um, as long as you get this note to uh, leave that note out for that person and mm. uh, everything will be sorted out and we, the people leave the room, but instead of following them, the camera waits and it's looking at the note and a gust comes in, moves the note and we all go, oh no. <laughs> and we see this all the time where it's something that that camera had always been tied to a character perspective before. And yet suddenly like they leave the room and the camera lingers for a couple of moments later to let the audience know that the characters think that they've sorted everything out, that everything has been dealt with. Oh no, it hasn't. And we see it, it it's used all of the time. Um, we have quite often uh, the tragedies quite often function with irony. Um, yeah. Oedipus. Yes, the irony of him knowing finally the truth. He sees all this time he's been blind. He thought he was seeing. And then when he finally does see, I mentioned this in an earlier video, he pokes out his eyes and he can no longer see, but he does see, right? Yeah. Yeah. Um, but, or even knowing the future saying, oh, well, in order to avoid this, I will do this thing. So, uh, oh, uh, your son is going to uh, grow up to kill you and marry your wife. And you're like, oh, well, I don't want that to happen. I'll kill my son. But that's the very thing that, you know, creates the whole yep. narrative. Or Oedipus deciding, oh, I'm going to leave home so I can avoid this fate when he finds out. But actually, in the process, he's running straight into his fate, right? Because he doesn't know he was adopted by this other couple over here. And, uh, you know, so, yeah. Uh, but, yeah. We also wanted so, to talk about... Uh, sorry, did you have another point on this one? or No, no, no. Okay. You, you, we, we really wanted to talk about uh, a, a really fantastic example of irony and uh, one of the most famous and really ought to be read, I think, by everyone. And that is Jonathan Swift's A Modest Proposal. You can see various layers of irony in this one. Uh, and I'm going to let you talk about this one because it is, uh, and I'll just chime in every now and again, but it is very important in the, the history of Ireland, uh, actually, uh, as a, uh, a testament to uh, <laughs> how things were when he wrote this uh, in the, uh, let's see, 18th century. Uh, so yeah, what, what, um, what kinds of irony do we find in Amaz's proposal and what is it? Well, for a start, uh, the potato famine is kind of a big deal. And that was ravaging Ireland. And because Ireland, uh, let's, uh, in a very reductive sense, let me just put it this way. And I know this is not the full complexity. I don't want to go in and spend a whole load of time on this. But because Ireland was being ruled by England and a lot of the English landowners had taken over all this land and Right. Uh, Irish farmers were subsisting on little crops. There was a, an over-reliance on potatoes as a source of food to keep people alive. Right. When the potato blight hits, the English were still exporting a lot of their crops uh, that they were growing for uh, commerce. But the potato blight affected the uh, sustenance for a lot of the Irish. And people were dying in a staggering a month. It was devastating. Um, and so what do we do about this situation? Mm. And at the time, there was so let, let me just some some people in power in England had quite a casual and cruel disregard for the plight of the Irish. The Irish were not well regarded. They were uh, regarded as subhuman. They were not well regarded. And therefore, these people didn't care to drum up potential support and to critique this lack of caring. Swift writes an essay called A Modest Proposal. Even the title is ironic. Yeah. In which he suggests, well, why don't the Irish just eat their children? I mean, essentially, that's what it boils down to. It's it's a long, very eloquent explanation of 
here, I have a solution to this problem, actually. Uh, they're starving. And, and and he's essentially repeating the prejudices of the people you mentioned, the, the ones who, who are just uh, the, those in power uh, who regard the Irish as subhuman. Uh, and yeah, I think you were being very polite about it. <laughs> but uh, but he essentially repeats their perspective very ironically and says, well, these Irish, there's too many of them. They keep breeding and and also, you know, they're starving right now. So, hey, I have a solution. Let's just have them eat their babies. And he goes into detail, detail about all the things you can do, all the ways you can cook them. And all the things you can do, and even in fact, why waste the skin? You could make gloves for ladies back in England, which is a okay. So that's where he's he's getting a little like on the nose there. The idea that you would um, skin them and wear their skin is is a perfect metaphor for the exploitation that he is railing against in this, and he never winks once. He just no. the whole thing all the way through. He's proposing it almost in this tone that feels like if you're just reading it very literally dead serious, of course, you understanding this is satire. This is he's making a very, very important point here in a way that is shocking and effective. Right. Because what, what he did was he took those prejudices and gave them their natural extension. Right. And used the same rhetoric, the same diction, right. the same approach exhibited the same callous disregard right. and well i'm just being objective and logical if there are too many of them and they are starving we can reduce their numbers and feed them at the same time so logically they should just eat their children right and it's it's presented so so brutally that, yeah um but also and, i think it, he's essentially saying underneath all of that what he's saying is the english are devouring the irish this is what he's saying right and that's that's when we start getting into the multiple layers of subtext and it's why it is such a powerful text because you realize then that the, that surface level is this presentation of an argument for how to deal with this problem right. but how it is being relayed what it is focused on the examples as you mentioned about using the leather created from the, the slain children right being useful for ladies in england you're like you could, we start to see the symbolism we start to see those symbolic meanings and you know people who care to can look into swift's background and have a look about uh, have a look at where he was from he's english really um i mean he was representing england the the anglican church in ireland uh, so not everyone in power, obviously, in England yeah. was uh, brutal and exploitative and callous, right? But, and this is one of those things, he was on the ground. Right. Not like, so, oh, well, that's just a problem over there. Interestingly enough, you can then look at a poem that Neil Gaiman did called Baby Kids. Uh -huh. Which is essentially the same thing, used in a slightly different way, and it's in a poem form. But it was about... Um, how one day all the animals disappear so what are we going to eat and then the the poet is suggesting well we should eat babies and it goes through this whole thing in exactly the same way and he ends the poem with and then one day all the babies disappear yeah what are we going to do now and it's oh well we'll figure something out you know humans are smart it's this refrain all the way through that and again wonderful poem but at no point do you think that Neil Gaiman or Jonathan, Jonathan Swift are are saying, yes, this is literally what we should do. Right. The use of those texts is to suggest something so abhorrent, knowing that it is so abhorrent, because they are making a point. Right. And um, the Which again goes button. back to tone. Hmm. The attitude of the implied author or narrator that's what you're trying to that's what you're supposed to pick up on toward the characters and the events and the discrepancy in this case of the of a modest proposal what you have is hyperbole right and you have an obvious discrepancy between the literal meaning what he's saying and the deeper implied meaning the critique that he is masterfully putting forward here uh so 
and one of the curious things, uh, there's a friend of mine who has been teaching Irish history for years, and mm -hmm. she always taught a modest proposal. Yeah. And every year. At there least are people one who don't student, get it. Yeah. Yeah. At least one student, usually more, would go, that was like, how horrible. How could anyone have ever written? Right. Because, again, reading it on that very, very literal level. Right. Um, and, it, you know, again, it shows how we can misread things. Sure. Um, but, yeah, like satire and uh, these sorts of critiques quite often are signaled through things like tone and, and style right. and, you know, create the, the impression of the genre that we should be sort of orienting ourselves around. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, so I think we've covered uh, the style and the tone and uh, that sort of thing pretty well. Let's extend this conversation to audience uh, and genre because these are important things to talk about that relate to tone and style. We've been talking about satire as a genre, for example. And understanding that something is a satire is should change the way that you read it. You should be on the alert. Oh, okay, I need to look for a deeper meaning, something beneath the surface here, right? Uh, so AP, what do we want to say about genre and audience? Well, for a start, when we talk about genre, you can start with like broad literary genres, poetry, prose, and drama, right? And you go, those are the, the three genres. You talk to any reader today and go, name me a genre. They're not likely to say poetry, prose, or drama. They're more They're likely to romance. say romance, science fiction, horror, uh, you know, pick fantasy, a the best of fantasy. Um, because <laughs> genre, in essence, is just a loose grouping of like with like. It is just a way to create a uh, set. They are not concrete. Uh, the rules and constructions of genre shift and change over time. Uh, what used to be considered a very racy novel and a bodice maybe, ripper and maybe even erotica, we, we would know quite a lot. Uh, a lot of modern readers would look at and go, that's exceptionally tame. Uh, yes, but didn't you notice that she showed her ankles? <laughs> <laughs> because the rules the construction can can shift and change over time what we would think of as like deeply horrific uh when we look at a lot of the gothic uh and we look at the early gothic we look at that now and go, well that's not really what we think of sometimes when we think of horror it's a particular type of horror but thriller and slasher can also have connections to horror that genre definitions are not fixed. They aren't concrete boxes with these well-defined walls. No matter how many people argue that they are, they honestly, they are not. They should We had a them. whole discussion the other day on uh, Josh's channel, Red Fury Books, with you and myself and Bridger from the Library Ladder, attempting to define classic fantasy. Just like that little bit of inside this genre of fantasy, and we couldn't do it. <laughs> <laughs> to be um, fair it, it's because as you said these things are not fixed right yeah uh, but one of the other things is um genres one of the reasons we group them with those sort of subject genres rather than uh, poetry prose and drama is that we've identified some characteristics that appear frequently in a large number of do you see the wiggle room built into that description? Right. Um, and because of that, there are certain potentially expectations built up in your readership. There are expectations about the type of reader. And the construction of genre and the associated readership or audience, quite often there can be very strong links and assumptions made, or there can be uh, weak links. But if we said stereotypically, and I want to be very clear, this is a stereotype, not a true thing. The majority of romance readers, female. And you know, does that mean no men read romance? No. Does that mean that only women read romance or women of a certain? But we make assumptions about it. 
Right. And quite often when authors say, I write only for myself. Um, I write the stories that I want to read. You know, that's great. They're actually making assumptions about, uh, about genre and audience. Hmm. Because if you say, I want to write stories that I want to read, you are in your head imagining an audience of someone like you and the characteristics that you've kind of assigned to yourself, the uh, beliefs or desires and preferences that you've assigned to yourself. So those, those so assumptions, that, those just briefly, I'll interject. Those assumptions you talked about are so powerful that if we're just sticking with the genre of romance, there are male authors who write romance, but a lot of them will go by uh, a, a, a female sounding pen name, right? Because they want to conform to those assumptions, right? Or or use the uh, the letter abbreviations and right. a surname because of course that's what a lot of female authors had to do in yes. order to get published in other genres. Correct. Uh, even assumptions that women write uh, write romance or women write romanticy or YA, uh, yeah, and okay. YA and children's, right. but don't write hard science fiction. You're like, right. no, there were a bunch of brilliant female authors who wrote science fiction, who were pioneers of science fiction of all types. We have it in all genres, but a lot of, uh, why did George Eliot write under the name George Eliot? Instead of Marianne Evans, yeah. Yeah, well. Because, well, no one would want to read something written by a woman. For the same reason that JK Rowling more than a hundred years later went by JK instead of her full name yeah so there are assumptions built into readership and genre and if we think if we have a story uh, a narrative that we want to tell and you go right i want to tell this to eight-year-olds mm -hmm. or i want to tell it to teenagers or i want to tell it to adults now if you think well, we talked before about gulliver's travels there's usually a children's version of gulliver's travels yeah. <laughs> now, admittedly, there are all those people out there who were so offended that anyone would ever dare try and change Roald Dahl's books uh, mm. now that he is dead. And I am sure they are equally offended that um, Gulliver's Travels has been edited long after uh, Swift died to make it appropriate for children. I am sure they are equally upset. Um, or the children's Dickens books where the language has been changed and shifted to be more appropriate for a younger audience. Or the children's Shakespeare's books, uh, boulderized. <laughs> um, but of course, all sort of censorship is wrong. And I expect those people who were so offended at Roald Dahl, on, or sorry, on Roald Dahl's behalf, would be equally offended at all of these children's classics. Um, because it's exactly the same thing. Anyway. The point being, we can take we can take the story that was intended for one audience, take the Odyssey, and then we make a children's version of it that right. is more appropriate, or at least we feel is more appropriate for it to be told to children. And then we might change it again for a different audience. So even the age of your audience yeah. can yeah. radically shift how, why, the diction, the tone, the style, the exactly. word, uh, word choice, word structure, sentence structure, paragraph structure, all of these things can be radically changed depending on how the author or the writer is perceiving the potential audience. Mm -hmm. Yep. Um, if, if we take some of the older fantasy texts and we went, if we were, if that author was writing them today, would they write them in exactly the same way? You know, no, they wouldn't. They would actually change quite a lot of things to reflect and cater to what they would perceive as the modern audience yeah. because social mores have changed, social conventions have changed, um, politics and ideology and all of these, those things. Have levels changed. of literacy have changed in different ways. I mean, look at um, Le Guin's A Wizard of Ursi. That was supposedly children's fiction yeah. back in the day. That would not be children's fiction today uh, at all. Uh, and uh, so, I mean, that's just a you know pretty clear example, I think. Um, and so there can be assumptions made about genre that 
are not borne out or can be exaggerated. Epic fantasy as a subgenre may have a predominantly male readership, but that might be 57% or 60% predominantly male. That's not saying that no women do, uh, read it or even that there aren't a significant number of women reading it. However, there might be an assumption that when we say predominantly male readership, that it's in the 95 to 99%. And therefore we exclude a conception of other people within that audience. We make assumptions like that all the time, particularly about audience. And the thing is authors sometimes have much better ideas about demographics because their publishers or their agents will tell them mm, yeah. and they'll do research in this. But authors can make those same assumptions and those assumptions, I write only for myself. You're like, you're writing for someone like you, which means you're writing to cater to a person of certain aspects of your demographic breakdown. Right. Which is then writing for an intended audience. Right. And again, audience consideration. If you look at the early Harry Potter books, much more simple language compared the very first one to the last one. And look at the word type sentence length. You could do that analysis and go, this is written for an older audience. Right. And because it's reflective you, you can, in... You can see the diction changing, right? You yeah. can see the uh, figures of speech, all of it. Uh, so the style actually changes there, yeah. So I think that's a that's a fascinating thing. Uh, you know, we've talked about this before, I've said about Twilight. Twilight, if you read it as a romance, conforms to a lot of the conventions found within the romance genre. Right. Whether we love them or not, whether you think they are well deployed or not, that's a different thing. But you look at it and you go, yeah, these are the conventions of that genre. Right. But if you look you're at reading it, it as, as horror, a, you're going to be sorely disappointed. <laughs> the only horror is what it has inflicted upon you. <laughs> um, if you read it as fantasy, if you read it as science fiction, as you, you know, if you, these, these genre assumptions can sometimes be lenses that we use. And if it's not conforming to our expectation of the lens, we're, we're not paying attention to what the book is trying to communicate or what the author is trying to communicate through the book. What we're doing is, well, why is this not fulfilling what I think it should be? Yeah. And again, that's, it's one of the things that we struggle with when we read, because if we make assumptions about genre, if we make assumptions about audience, that can reshape and uh, distort our impression of the text. Mm. Well said, well said. So these are things to keep in mind uh, when you're analyzing a story, which is what we're talking about here. This is our series, which uh, we're getting close to the end of the series, but uh, we are going to have two more videos. One is going to focus on theme, which to me is the, the element that kind of brings together a lot of these other elements much of the time. When you're talking about characters and analyzing them and looking at how they change in the course of the story. Often you're, you're on the trail to theme when you're talking about symbols and, and how uh, to interpret them and analyze them in their various ways. You're, you're, you're getting closer and closer to, to the themes of the story. Even when you're talking about things like setting, you know, setting can often be uh, a very important element in the theme of the story. We'll talk about all that later, but all these different things, uh, to me, all I mean, they all do interconnect in for some pretty cool ways. Uh, and hopefully that's becoming clearer as we get through the series. But theme is where I see sort of the, the middle of the web, I guess, where everything sort of comes together beautifully. Um, so I'm looking forward to that discussion. And then after that, if you guys have questions along the way, we are going to attempt to answer them in a final video, a ninth video in this series. And we will probably also try to bring up some things that we realized that we we forgot uh, or that we neglected um, earlier in the series. But we will look back at the various videos, at questions that we maybe answered in a, a perfunctory manner and, and try to give a better answer, more thorough answer. And uh, we'll try to uh, pick up some of the threads that we want to just uh, elaborate on or things that we miss. Does that sound like a good plan, AP? It sounds like a wonderful plan. Diabolical, nefarious. Ambiguity in what I meant. Mm, Interpret. <laughs> <More. laughs> 
<laughs> All right. Thank you, everybody, for watching this. And uh, we will see you next time. Until then.